Hello everyone, I am Kathy. I am a volunteer here at Salt Haven Wildlife Rehabilitation and Education Center. And today we're chatting with Salt Haven founder, Brian Salt. And we've got a lot to cover today. Thank you very much for joining us uh, on your Sunday afternoon. Um, obviously, we are masked up today, and that's not a normal part of the, uh, the equipment for the staff or volunteers here, but Brian, I know that the, the health and safety of um, your staff and volunteers is number one for you, um, and, and obviously we have to wear these given that we're in the middle of a pandemic. Yes, that's true. In fact, sometimes we'll wear masks even when we're not in the middle of a pandemic. Our first pillar in our, in our volunteer foundation is keeping volunteers safe, and then keeping the animals safe, and then making sure the volunteers have a meaningful experience. So those three pillars are really first and foremost in our volunteer program. So talk a little bit about how things have changed here at Salt Haven because of COVID-19. Mm, yeah, change they have. You know, normally we operate with about 100 uh, clinical volunteers that work three shifts a day, seven days a week, uh, from April right through to late September. However, this year, we've had to pare that down to about 35 volunteers that are working those shifts. Uh, and it gives us more options for social distancing, as well as we have to take time to be cleaning. So as a result, the number of animals we do have been down this year as well. Right, and so how, how much down compared to a typical year? Yeah, we're down about 50%. Uh, but, you know, when you consider the number of volunteers that we have working that 50%, that's a big job. Right. Okay, so obviously we're wearing masks today, and Sydney, who's working the camera for us today, she also has her mask on. Um, what are the other protocols that you've put on um, or put into place here at the clinic? Yeah, well, gloves are mandatory as well when we're working with all animals. Um, you know, there's been talk about how that virus can be uh, transferred to animals or from animals to people, and so we, we have to take those necessary precautions. Washing your hands, we have um, sanitizing stations at every room in the clinic, and uh, at the end of the day, the clinic is uh, thoroughly sanitized. After every shift, the clinic is sanitized as well. Door handles, microwaves, ovens, uh, uh, light switches, etc. Now we're here in the clinic and this is a relatively new location for Salt Haven and this is the first time we're actually going live from this new clinic uh, so hopefully the internet is working we're out in a rural uh, remote area in the county um, so bear with us if it's if it flickers a little bit um, but talk about the the clinic and how it is different from your previous location well, the previous location, uh, we operated out of a one-room clinic. Uh, we didn't even have uh, hot running water in the other clinic. So we were really camping, uh, basically, but uh, it was a wonderful location in the sense that our landlords were very, um, uh, they were able to accommodate our needs there. Uh, but this clinic is, gosh, it's wonderful. I mean, it's an eight-room clinic. We have uh, isolation rooms. Uh, we have a... Uh, uh, flight pens and a, a brand new um, uh, aviary uh, and a muse, we're a seven station muse for our birds of prey. So, you know, it's a, it's a lot more territory, and uh, but we also have a large garden that uh, Sydney, our camera lady today, has uh, she has put that together, and about 10 volunteers have uh, grown things that we've been able to use in the clinic for the animals. So. It's kind of exciting all the way around what's happening here. And, and really it was a, a, a community effort that pulled this mm -hmm. together because I remember when Sydney was starting the garden and we put a call out for, for mulch um, and you know the items were donated and, and the support for building the, the muse that you're talking about, the rafters enclosure and that. It really is um, a community effort that keeps Salt Haven going. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the mayor's husband came out and rode a tail the garden for us. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's that type of thing. And, and we've, we have focused a lot of our, our needs, day-to-day -day needs, that we have to go, that we have to buy uh, in the community itself as well to return that, uh, that favor. And it's, it's been a wonderful experience. We're glad we're here. Okay. Um, now, you... you you talked about a lot of stuff with the clinic. Um, if we talk about the raptors enclosure, and um, 
for those who haven't seen it, we recently did a video. It's on the Salt Haven YouTube channel, so you can go and check it out there, and it gives you a bit of an inside look as to what it looks like. It kind of looks like a, a horse's stable almost, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then, like you said, this is for the birds of prey, the raptors. Um, so it's both your Salt Haven ambassadors as well as patients who are in there. Yeah, that's right. Uh, we, um, we, we really are blessed to have uh, a, a thing like that. Um, we, we put in, it was really hot. The, the old muse we had back at Salt, the old Salt Haven had pine trees all around it, so it was shaded. But this is more out in the open, so we were able to uh, get a grant to have uh, a sprinkler system put in there, a misting system, which uh, lowers the temperature by about four or five degrees, which is really, really nice. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot more sanitary. Uh, we have gravel for the, uh, for the, the floor and uh, perches that are heated for the winter time, um, shutters for the windows. Uh, it's wonderful, it really is. And then in terms of um, the, the birds that are staying in there, you said there's eight spaces? There's seven, seven, seven spaces altogether. Okay, yeah. so what happens if you're full and you get another raptor patient that needs to come in? Can you put two red-tailed hawks together in the same muse, or are they just so territorial that that won't fly? No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, sometimes it doesn't fly, and uh, but it really depends on the time of year, too. Um, they have a tendency to be more territorial around nesting season. But yeah, you could put a couple of red-tailed hawks in the same muse. Okay. Um, but usually we're moving them in and out so fast, you know, like we, as soon as they're ready to go, we test fly them, look for a weather window, boom, they're gone. And then we can move another one in. Oftentimes the birds that come to us initially are really down and out and they really can't perch even. So we put them in recovery hoods and uh, we're able to medicate them a lot easier, a lot less stress for the bird because they feel kind of tight and, and closed in there and safe and uh, then as soon as they're ready we move them out into an empty muse. If we could talk a little bit about the um, the, the numbers um, that go into running Salt Haven. So you talked earlier about the number of volunteers. Um, how many animals would you typically see over the course of a year, a typical year? Yeah, a typical year we see about 2,000 animals and uh, that's here in our Salt Haven Strathroy. And we also have Salt Haven West in, in Regina, Saskatchewan, and they do about 750 animals as well. So there's quite a bit. Um, we, this year we did uh, over 100 different species of animals, and uh, some of the numbers, when we look back at it, oh my gosh, like we did over 250 wild bunnies this year wow. that uh, came in. And we, we end up with about a 60%, 65% success rate at the end of the year, too. And that's pretty good considering the condition they come in under. You can't save them all, but uh, by and large, uh, we save a good number of them. One question that we've gotten over the couple of years that I've been part of Salt Haven as a volunteer, oh, and for those who are just joining us, so I'm Kathy, I'm a volunteer here at Salt Haven, and we're chatting with Brian Salt, who is the founder of Salt Haven. Um, so in, in terms of, um, uh, yeah, one of the questions that we've gotten over the course of the years is, do you name the animals when they come mm -hmm. in? And, and it must be heart-wrenching, especially if an animal has been with you for a while and you aren't able to save it. Yeah, you know, when, when we first started years ago, I was strictly against giving the animals names because you just become too emotionally involved. Um, but I've learned since that it, it, it serves as a, an identifier for the animal. You know, when somebody says, Shakar, uh, his muse needs cleaning or he needs fresh water or whatever, we know exactly who that is and where to go. So yeah, they do get names, and uh, and that's okay by me now. I think uh, we've kind of evolved on that issue. And then another way that you identify the animals is you will paint their foreheads. So I've seen mm -hmm. bats with paints on their heads and <laughs> birds with paint on their heads. Yeah. What's all that about? Yeah, well, um, you know, you have animals in uh, a cage all together, for instance, and sometimes bats are put together. Uh, they're, they're very social animals, and, uh, but if one of those bats, say you might have six or seven of them in a large cage, if one of them needs medication and the others don't, you want to make sure you have the right one. Yeah. The amazing thing to me is that our bat squad, they can identify the animals just by looking at them, and uh, they get to know them that on a, an intimate level. 
but uh, we put those markers there anyway, just to make sure that the right animal is getting the right medication. And just so everybody's clear, it is non-toxic paint, right? It's not yeah. hurting the animal oh, in no, no, any no. way. <laughs> no, it is. It's an acrylic non-toxic paint, and it's just a little tiny dot. We don't need much then, so that we can identify them. Okay, so very nice segue because you mentioned bats, and we're actually sitting now in the bat squad room mm -hmm. where and and the team is just getting going now for the for the winter season. Talk to us about the bat squad and and what it is that they do. Uh, and maybe first, let's talk about bats themselves because. I think people have a love-hate relationship with them. They either love them or they hate them. They're terrified of them. Um, do bats get a bad rap? Well, sometimes they do, and that's because of Hollywood, right? Um, vampires, you know, oh, they yeah. suck all your blood. But yeah. in actual fact, bats are amazing animals. Um, they, they eat their own body weight in, in one night. Um, they, uh, they save farmers billions of dollars right across Canada every year. With all the insects that all they're eating, All the insects right? that they're eating. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they're, they're amazing animals anyway because the females will give birth to a baby that is 30% uh, of the female's body weight. So that'd be like a 100-pound woman giving birth to a 30-pound <laughs> baby. And sometimes they have twins, so go figure. It's amazing. <laughs> So, um, yeah, they're, they're very unique, but they are very, very intelligent as well. And that's something that people don't give them credit for all too often. We have a tendency as humans to give animals credit uh, based on how intelligent we think they are. And uh, bats, unfortunately, are right down at the bottom of that totem pole as to how we think about them. But uh, we've learned to really come to respect them and uh, feel real good about the work we do with bats here. Right, so talk about that and the bat squad and, and the work that they do in, in getting sick and injured bats back out into the wild. Yeah, our bat squad's amazing. It comprises of 10 volunteers. Uh, some of them are very, very experienced with bats. We have one from the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources doing studies at the Pinery on bats. Uh, each one of our individual bat squad members are vaccinated for the rabies vaccine, uh, with the rabies vaccine rather, and um, they are trained to deal with bats. They, they have different needs than, uh, than the other animals that we work with, so it's an entirely different operation within Salt Haven, and probably one of the best ones in southwestern Ontario at this point. And one of the questions that we, we do get when it's um, bat season is, uh, you know, bats and rabies, are they synonymous? And do all the bats and the, do the bats that come to Salt Haven have rabies? Well, typically, only about 2% or less of all bats actually have rabies. So, but they are rabies vector species, there's no doubt about that. And um, so we treat them with respect in that regard. Uh, we have, you know, we see more rabies in bats than the average person ever would simply because the bats that come to us are already sick or injured or, or what have you. And so just in that demographic alone, we're bound to see more rabies than we would otherwise. So we take precautions. We make sure we're wearing gloves when we handle them, uh, even though they rarely will bite. Uh, we, we also make sure that, as I say, all of our bat squad members have been vaccinated and they take a test with us as well so that uh, they understand what rabies is all about and uh, before they even step foot in the clinic. And then the, the bats are given a shot before they're mm. ever released? Yeah, before, as soon as they come in and they're able and they're stable, uh, we, uh, we give them a rabies vaccine and uh, that's followed up with another one uh, uh, about a month later. And before they're released, they're given another dose so that we have built up a wall against that virus when we release them. So not only are they healthy as individuals, but they contribute to the healthiness of the population of bats. And then uh, a common question, and we actually received a question on Facebook from a follower who, uh, it, it's about a cardinal, a female cardinal, that for one week now has constantly been flying into her dining room window. And she said she Googled it, she put um, material on the windows, she covered the windows, she tried to make it really bright, she's done everything she can think of short of chopping down the tree that's just outside her dining room window. Um, so any idea what's going on with that particular bird at this time of year? Yeah, it's unusual for this time of the year, but it's, generally speaking what this is is a territorial dispute. And uh, robins and cardinals seem to be the ones that are most aggressive with this. If they see their reflection in the window, uh, they're seeing another bird that's invading their territory. Oftentimes they have a nest in the area, and they will. They'll hit that window every 20 seconds and uh, just drives you crazy. And they'll hit it so hard that they'll actually leave blood on the window. 
So, um, the, the, but the only way around that is to either soap the window or cover the window completely from the outside so that the bird no longer sees its reflection and you break the cycle and things go better. But just about every other w way of doing it doesn't work very well. Right, and, and then it's something that you guys have addressed here because you were getting a lot of window or birds flying into your mm -hmm. windows here. Um, so, and this is a common question that mm -hmm. we get, you know, how can you stop birds from flying into windows? Yes, well we, uh, we embarked on a, a, um, a program called Feather Friendly here at Salt Haven. And they're little decals, they come in a strip, and you just lay them on your window. They're dots, so you can barely see them from the inside. But from the outside, they shine like beacons to the birds because they're fluorescent. And the birds see different colors than we do more vividly. And uh, so it has reduced our window strikes practically to zero because of these uh, little dots we put on our windows. Not expensive, easily installed, and uh, it's very, very feather friendly. Right, and that's the name of the company out of Mississauga, right? Feather Friendly. That's and true. then there's also FLAP is an organization. Yeah, FLAP is an organization that stands for Fatal Light Awareness Program out of Toronto, and uh, they heavily endorse this company as well for uh, making windows uh, friendly to birds so they're not getting hurt. Okay, and we did get a question from one of our followers on Instagram, and she's wondering about opossums. Mm. and doesn't know very much about them and would like to know a little bit more. And you do see possums up here. Like, how do they get here? <laughs> they don't seem like they're, they're not native to Canada, right? No, no, they're not. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're incredible animals, but they're, we're seeing more and more of them in the last 10 years, mainly because truck traffic from the United States, southern states, has moved up here. And uh, oftentimes these possums will crawl up in the back of a fruit truck. They love fruit. But the temperature is 20 degrees above when they leave, and it's 20 degrees below when they get here. They don't have any fur on their paws or their ears or that prehensile tail, and they suffer miserably from frostbite here. If the first winter doesn't kill them, the second one usually does. They're amazing creatures because they have opposing thumbs, just like we do. Primates and humans have that, but not too many animals in the animal kingdom yeah. do. They're the only marsupial in all of North America. They have a pouch, just like a kangaroo or a koala bear, and uh, they, um, they not only have opposing thumbs on their front feet, but they got them on their back feet as well. And if that's not enough, they got a prehensile tail like an elephant's trunk. They can climb just about anything. They're incredible. But as I say, they don't do too well in our Ontario winters here. It's kind of sad, actually, but, you know, we've got one right here right now, and, uh, you know, you release them in the spring, and you just know they're okay until the fall again, but then things start to happen bad. Yeah, so are they good for the environment? Are they bad? Mm. Or do we want to be attracting them to our backyards? And, and if we do, is there something that we can do to make it a more inviting environment for them to, so that they can survive the winter? Yeah, well, you know, if you've got rats or mice uh, uh, being a problem, opossums are death on rats and mice. They love eating those things. So, um, and if you wanted to attract them or to keep them in a warm place, uh, you can put, set up a little kennel or something in the backyard. Uh, if you've got a compost, another reason for having a compost, those will burrow right in there and the warmth from the compost will keep them through the winter. And you've got ready-made food in there sometimes, too. <laughs> Uh, I'm checking, and we also got another question um, about peregrine falcons, and this came from someone on, on our Instagram um, feed, and uh, same sort of thing. She wants to know a little bit more about peregrine falcons, doesn't know too much. Unfortunately, we did have a sad story here earlier this year with, uh, with Thunder, who is uh, well known uh, among the birding community in London for gracing our skies over, over the downtown. Um, so tell us a little bit about Thunder's story and then, um, you know, what's an interesting tidbit of information about a peregrine falcon? Well, peregrine falcons, first of all, are the fastest animal on the planet. They've been clocked at over 250 miles an hour in the dive. Ooh. And that's pretty, pretty fast. You can imagine standing up in a convertible at 250 miles an hour and what that would do to you. <laughs> but they, uh, they're streamlined, their body allows them to accelerate through gravity. Um, they, uh, it was unfortunate in the case of Thunder. She's been around for a long time. She was first banded in a nest in Syracuse, New York in 2015. So she's about 15 years old, which is a long life for a peregrine falcon. They usually live 13, 14 years in the wild. But we think what happened to her was a territorial dispute with another falcon. And uh, she uh, had some fractures and some bad uh, injuries to her wing. Uh, and um, we, we tried everything to repair that and to make it better so that she could get back out into the wild. 
but it just wasn't meant to be. Um, her age and the location of the fracture, um, my gosh, it was, uh, it was a big effort. And, and again, on, not only the part of Salt Haven, but on the community as well, because a lot of people came to the table and helped us with the expense of that. Right. And uh, so it was, a, it was a heavy heart day when uh, that didn't work out very well for Thunder. But uh, it, what it did here at Salt Haven is it developed a, a new uh, and a wonderful perspective on these amazing animals and uh, just their value in the environment. You talked there about um, how the community really stepped up to help cover the costs of, you know, getting thunder. She had to go to the, the veterinary college in Guelph for, for surgeries and that, right? Um, how important is community in the work that Salt Haven does? Well, Salt Haven has literally become a community effort. It's not about Brian Salt or any other one person in the organization. Um, we, we get help from everywhere in the community. It's absolutely wonderful. And I think the return, the reciprocal reaction here is that the general public are gaining more knowledge about the plight of Canadian wildlife. Our, our planet uh, needs some work, and uh, especially on, in the nature side where the animals are struggling right now. Uh, you know, we hear a lot about the Arctic, but right here in southwestern Ontario, we're losing an awful lot of species. And some animals have either been extirpated, meaning they're no longer found here, or or outright extinct, and uh, we've seen more of that happen in the last 50 years, one lifetime, uh, than we have in any other time in, in history, that recorded history at least. So we have some work to do, and uh, we think that uh, Salt Haven is helping to make the public aware of the plight that uh, our, our wildlife is in right now. So we talked earlier about volunteering, and that you, you, Salt Haven relies a lot on the support of volunteers. How old do you have to be to start volunteering at Salt Haven? Well, we'll accept applications from people who are uh, 16 and over, uh, 16 with parents' consent, otherwise age 18. And uh, it, we, uh, we just feel strongly that, again, we want to keep our volunteers safe. And uh, young people seem to be more prone to some of the diseases we see that animals can share. And uh, so we, we don't want to take them too young. And uh, we want them to be responsible as well. And, uh, so age 16 uh, or otherwise age 18. And then some people, they may love animals and wildlife, but they're a little apprehensive about actually working hands-on with the animals. So you look for volunteers with a wide range of mm. skills. So talk about the kind of skill sets that you look for. Yeah, we can use uh, carpenters, electricians, plumbers, uh, groundskeepers. Uh, we have some volunteers that come up our grounds here at Salt Haven are absolutely beautiful, and uh, th there's a lot of there's a price to pay for beauty. <laughs> we gotta <laughs> we gotta work those gardens and whatnot, and uh, a lot of people have come out to do just that. So uh, we're grateful for that uh, type of support as well. With all the years that you've been in operation, you must have a couple of rescues that really stand out to you. And mm -hmm. while you're doing that, maybe Sydney can get a wildlife ambassador ready for yeah. us. Um, but yeah, talk about uh, a, a rescue that stands out? Well, we had a call um, last fall, um, there was a, um, or last, early last spring, sorry, of a, uh, a red-tailed hawk nest that had uh, made, they had made a nest on a, on a uh, construction site, uh, on a uh, apartment building, and... This was in London, right? This in was in London, London, London Wonderland Wonderland, Road. Right? Yeah. yeah, okay. And uh, so they, the construction was going to be a detriment to the bird's nest, and they wondered what could we do to, you know, to work around this. So w what we planned out with them was that they would build a platform, they would attach it to the wall away from the balcony, and provide a sloped roof on it so any cement falling from the construction uh, floors up would not impact the nest. And, um, and, and then we moved the nest. We went up on a cherry picker, we were about seven stories up, and we removed the nest with the eggs, took the eggs out first and put them in pouches, and then put the new nest on, the, on this platform that was made. Put the, the eggs back in the nest and then waited. Uh -huh. What seemed an eternity, <laughs> a couple hours later, and the, 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 the parents came back, sat on the nest, and started incubating the eggs again. Uh, the eggs hatched, and uh, those little ones uh, actually fledged and flighted and, and gone. So that was very uh, successful. Yeah, fantastic. All right, Sydney, 
Um, so this is Sydney, and who is Sydney bringing in? Sydney is bringing uh, one of our wildlife ambassadors. This is Rex Ann. Rex Ann used Anne. to be Rex, and um, then she laid eggs, so <laughs> she became Rex Ann. And you'll notice that she's flicking her tongue. Yeah. That's how snakes smell. They uh, they put that tongue out and they they uh, collect the the molecules in the air and then rub it up against the roof of their mouth in a thing called the Jacobson's pit. And it's loaded with sensory uh, organs there, and they can tell what's in the air. And uh, if if you feel them, they're kind of they're kind of cool. They don't thermal regulate like humans do. They they thermoregulate from their environment. So the warm sun or a heat rock or something like that is, is really uh, how they thermoregulate. Rexanne is a constrictor. She's a gray rat snake. Okay. And uh, they, uh, they'll hunt mice and rats. Um, they are allies to, our, um, to uh, our rodent population control. <laughs> yeah. And um, we encourage people not to use ro uh, rodenticides because we see a lot of secondary rodenticide poisoning and, and all kinds of animals, hawks and owls and snakes as well. Right, they so get, those animals will eat a mouse that has ingested the poison and then they, they end up getting poisoned yeah, as well. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, so uh, what's, uh, what's her job? Well, her job as a wildlife ambassador is to uh, spread that message of what's happening with our reptile populations in Ontario. And she goes with us when we do presentations. Right now we're doing Zoom presentations. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Rex comes out with uh, some of those presentations as well so that uh, people can uh, get an idea as to what these animals are all about. Snakes like bats have a real bad reputation yeah. uh, because of Hollywood in a lot of cases. And, she's beautiful. Uh, she yeah. really is, and she's very calm. She gets to in the summer, in spring and summertime, she gets to roam on her own for you know half hour at a time. Um, the volunteers will take a walkie-talkie with them, and as long as they can maintain visual contact, um, they they let them go where yeah. they want to go. So she gets the chance to be out in the wild as well. Okay, and then why can she not be released? Well, she is uh, actually she has quite a story. She uh, we think is. Uh, a hybrid between a gray rat snake and a eastern fox snake, and two of the largest snakes in Canada. Um, because she is a hybrid, likely um, we can't release her back into the wild. She came from the okay. Kellogg's plant, actually. Oh, okay. uh, when they were taking apart the old equipment there, uh, she found a real home in one of the pieces of equipment, and obviously was taking mice <laughs> out of the environment there. Yeah. And um, she came slithering out of one of the pieces of equipment, and we got the call. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thanks very much, Brian. Um, it's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you uh, found it entertaining and learned something today. I know I sure did. Uh, you can always go to the Salt Haven website, uh, salthaven.org, for more information. And you'll start looking for new volunteers um, in January. That's when you'll start mm -hmm. taking new applications. So you can find all the information about that on the website. And uh, it might be a little different next year, just like this year because of COVID. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, thank you again for joining us. And uh, what do you always say when you're wrapping up a video? I'm Brian Salt, helping you to keep the wild and wildlife. Thanks for joining us. Have a great and happy and safe holiday season.